we're going to get into um, our message for this evening, our study in the book of Daniel, chapter number nine. And uh, I don't want to uh, disappoint you all too much. Where we've been uh, past couple of weeks has been on the prophecies from chapter number seven and eight. Uh, tonight we won't be there. Okay, so we're uh, chapter nine. We'll discuss prophecy, but um, that's the second half of the chapter. Okay, so there there is. There's plenty to go with that. Now, there is some fulfillment of prophecy. Just to give you some some context where Daniel's at, uh, Daniel is in a time of prophecy being fulfilled. So that's where he's at at the time. In other words, they, they're see, he's seeing things. In fact, we're going to see it right there at the beginning of the chapter where he's reading passages of Scripture. He's reading the books and he's thinking, hey, that's happening right now. Does that relate at all? You ever get that? You read through the Bible like that's happening right now. And so we kind of have the, the kind of part two, I guess, on that kind of stuff. And so uh, well, the difference is we're reading New Testament and he was reading stuff previous to Daniel. And so obviously we're reading Old Testament as well. In fact, we're reading Daniel. So that's what's going on. But um, but anyways, um, I appreciate the the, um, the presentation on Howells Anderson College. I uh, appreciate anywhere that's a soul winning place. I think it's important. We need to have more of that. Um, I and I, I get this. I get a frustration. I'll just be honest with you. When I, when I hear people say, "Well, soul winning doesn't work," you guys hear that before? Uh, and listen, it doesn't work for a whole lot of reasons. Depend on what your goal is. Um, but if your if your soul winning goal is winning souls, that works. It really does work. And I appreciated the conversation. Uh, we didn't even get into Cracker Barrel, and Mrs. Frolke stopped, and, and uh, I, I forgot a mask. And the, talk about a divine appointment. I didn't bring a mask. I didn't have anything in the car. And by the way. Uh, that car, thank you all. You, you guys, uh, for all intents and purposes, make, make sure we can we can buy that. So thank you for that. But um, that's a different conversation. But I didn't have masks in there because in our van we've got like bins of masks that we always have. And so uh, I didn't have anything. I just I jumped in the car and took off to Cracker Barrel and we got out there. I thought I can't go in and they're you know they're they're uh, you know they're like fascists in there or something. And they wouldn't they wouldn't allow us in without without masks. So some lady out there said I've got an extra one. And I'm pretty sure it's for her kids because it really hurt to put it on. I couldn't fit it on. Uh, but regardless, she gave it to me. And, uh, and then Miss Rolke stayed and shared the gospel with her. And she sat and, and uh, brother and I we went in there and, and ate or got ready to eat. While she stayed out there and shared the gospel, she got saved. So praise the Lord for that. It works. So winning souls works when your goal is to win the souls. And that, that's, that's what it works for. And that's, it does work. And so we're thankful for that. Um, so I appreciate that there's a whole school up there that's doing that. Um, thankful for college students and and a lot of times there's kind of this lack of what to do and there's a lot of avenues of preparation that allow us to to serve the lord just as best as we can all right so uh so that gives us an opportunity to be in prayer for hiles anderson college all right daniel chapter number nine verse number one in the first year of darius the son of ahasuerus the seed of the medes which was made king over the realm of the chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Okay, uh, quickly here, just as far as explanation on what's going on here, uh, we have to remember Daniel, we've been going through, and brother, we've actually started back in 1 Samuel and been going chronologically since then and so now we're in Daniel um, this is getting there about the 70th year close to 70th year 70th year and what's happening is that Daniel is studying the Bible and as he studies the Bible he looks and reads other things that are written for instance Jeremiah which by the way had just recently been written um, it was it was right before Daniel that Jeremiah had been penned and it warned about what was going to happen and talked specifically about the fact that Jerusalem and specifically Judah the nation of Judah which had absorbed for the most part Beth um, Benjamin, they were going to be carried away captive. The northern kingdom was already gone. The southern kingdom, though, was holding its ground. They were actually quite strong in the fear of the Middle East in many ways. But uh, but the Babylonians that had come in were, um, were, were taking them captive, and that was when Daniel was a young man. And uh, anyways, as he's been reading, though, and you'll notice that this is during a time period. Notice what's the time period here in the first year of Darius. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, it's obviously following what is mes what's mentioned in chapter number eight, chapter number seven. Now, when chapter number seven, you find that uh, one of the things that, that the context of what was going on, that this was in the uh, two years before Babylon fell. Chapter number uh, eight is the year Babylon fell. So in the, the third year of Belshazzar. And so that's a big deal, by the way, because it's going to fall in a really, really big way. So now it's the first year of Darius. So we've been going chronologically here uh, in those 
time periods, and it's getting close to the 70 year mark that Daniel has been in Babylon. Now, Daniel didn't go at the very beginning, by the way, of the captivity of Jerusalem. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar actually invaded Jerusalem several times, and Daniel was part one of that, so the first invasion. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar had actually come from a loss, uh, actually a victory where he had demolished uh, King Nebo, Pharaoh, Pharaoh Nico down in, uh, in Egypt, and on his way back, had demolished Jerusalem as well and took a bunch of people with them. That was invasion number one. Actually, would come back another two times as well. And so Jerusalem was still on its own. They, they had not been completely demolished when, when Daniel went in. And by the way, that actually answers a few things because um, when you read this, you find that Daniel actually is going to stay in Babylon for a little bit more than 70 years, even though the bondage or the captivity is prophesied to only be 70 years. Some people say, why? Well, because the bond, the captivity of Jerusalem as a whole had not happened yet when Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel first came. All right, so a little context there. Now, uh, anyways, with this here, it's been now about 70 years, almost again very close to 70 years. And he's reading, thinking, hey, wait a second. If God said it's going to be 70 years, then... Uh, then that's now. That's about this time. So back in Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, you're welcome to turn there, but I'm just going to go and read starting verse number 10. It says, For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years, so Jeremiah is speaking, after 70 years shall be accomplished. In other words, when that's done at Babylon, so whence you guys are all there, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. In other words, the things that I have said. What he tells them, and this is a key word in this chapter, is this word covenants. He's going to address it from the very beginning all the way to the very end of chapter number nine. You're going to hear this word covenant mentioned several times. Now, what he's saying here is that I will perform what my covenant is. I will perform my word, my good word towards you. That is in the covenant, which is mentioned multiple times. And, and we won't. That's that's more in the study next week. He's saying that I will fulfill everything that I have promised that I will fulfill. I'm going to do it. But you have to finish the punishment for what you have done. That's chastisement that you're going to go through in causing you to return to this place. This is what I want for you to be back here. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. That then shall ye call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where they have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place where I cause you to be carried away captive. And he's saying, all right, here it's going to be coming. Because according to Jeremiah, that time of 70 years is, is about done. So Daniel's reading this is thinking, this makes sense. No, the question for you. What would you do if this is your circumstance where suddenly you're thinking, OK, it's been bad. In fact, they've been in captivity. And by the way, Daniel's not in the worst spot in regards to captivity, is he? He's a leader. You know, as a leader, more than likely, he's not living out in poverty. He's not living out with the, without any privileges. He's doing quite well in Babylon. And Jeremiah had instructed him, by the way, that when they go to Babylon to make sure that they, they work and they build their houses and that they prosper and they add to the prosperity of that nation. In other words, this wicked, ungodly, heathen nation, he says, I want you to help them be better at it. That's what he's telling them to do. That's a pretty big deal where they could have had a bunch of resentment, but God said, don't. You make sure you succeed when you get out there. It's part of the testimony of the Lord and his people there. And so if that's the case there, uh, they're out there. And Daniel could even say, okay, well, we'll go back pretty soon, but I'm living pretty good. In fact, the transition of power from the time that Babylon fell to the Medes taking over, which is one in the same event there. But when that took place there, he got to transfer some authority there. He was still a leader. In fact, as we see this, we're also seeing that Daniel doesn't just have a position there in the nation of Babylon, and likewise amongst the Medo-Persian Empire, but he has a specific point of pro prominence as a prophet and teacher there in Babylon for the Jews that have been displaced. In other words, they've gone somewhere and they've got a leader a spiritual leader such as they had with Jeremiah, such as they had with Isaiah, others who had prophesied and they had specifically a teacher. And what God is saying is I will raise that prophet up. I will raise up those teachers that will drive you back to God. And so with this, he could easily say, OK, well, it's almost done. Well, I'll just kind of wait and do nothing. Because that'd be awfully tempting to do, wasn't it? I've noticed that uh, you've referenced my youth a number of times and sometimes I don't feel feel young. In fact this evening I had a had a headache. I was struggling just even concentrating so I took some Tylenol and them. It's it's almost working right now. So I think I'm almost there. But as uh, as I'm getting slightly older, just one year after another, I realize something is that I'm becoming less patient. 
It's true. Uh, and it's, 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 and now I don't know if maybe it's all self-imposed. Uh, we want faster internet. You know, I'm, I'm upset when my, uh, when my 100, what is it, 100 gig internet at home is not fast enough. And it uh, takes like all of a couple of seconds to load a certain web page up or something, you know, and it's upsetting because, oh, I can't believe how slow this is. Uh, and, and we just we stream everything. I used to play something called DVDs. And uh, I was reminded, uh, you gave me a DVD tonight. I'm like, I don't, I don't even know that we can play this kind of thing. I haven't even, like, I, I know they sell them and they're around. I haven't even played one for a while. And so anyways, we had to make sure it would work when it got up there. So anyways, uh, what's that? Old fashioned, yes, and that's DVDs. A thumb, yeah, wrong finger though. It's the thumb drive. Yeah, that's this. I'm just kidding. But anyways, the the point is that when we have all these progressions, and and by the way, a, a CD, a, a DVD, a Blu-ray DVD, all those. Things. I have a Blu-ray DVD player, but I don't know that we've ever played a DVD on it. And so, uh, in fact, I don't even know where it is. So maybe my wife sold it. I don't even know. But the, but the point is, we were progressing on speed and convenience and and uh, and, and space. Even we just want to modify everything, trying to get everything uh, interconnected. All our devices uh, are interconnected. We social network, and so we know everything about everyone immediately. And I, I congratulated a pastor on becoming the pastor of his church before he found out about it. And, uh, and I didn't go to the church. I didn't even know anybody there. But somehow I got a notification that they had just voted him in at this church. I'd been there one time before. And, uh, and so I congrat hey, congratulations on becoming the pastor. He said, really? I didn't, I didn't know. And so that's, uh, I was the first person to congratulate him. And so anyways, uh, he's still up there. He's up in Tipton. But uh, anyways, with that, we're, we're so interconnected. And everything's fast that we get less, we get, we're less patient about what we're doing. And what we really struggle with is a simple idea of just stopping. I'm just stopping. Now, we're going to get into prophecy, and, and, and he's talked about it with the 70 weeks and all that, but he's not going to explain that. Now, his first thought was 70 weeks in this passage, of, I'm sorry, 70 years with this passage of Scripture back in chapter in verse number 2. He's going to address that. He wants to get more understanding about it, but the first thing he does, the very first thing he does, look at verse number 3. And I said, this is his response, and I said, my face unto the Lord God. How did, he, how did he do this? How did he set his face to the Lord God? In other words, there are times where I have a great, um, great relationship with ind individuals that I really just want to talk with them, and I will set my face toward them. I want to talk with them. And, and it's, it's not okay just to, um, to randomly be sitting there. Um, my wife and I have watched you know, like movies on a date night or something like that, and we'll be sitting there watching a movie. But there's not, there's not like, oh man, I just, I just felt like I learned so much about you by sitting here on the couch and watching this movie and not talking for shh, good for, you don't learn anything, right? Um, but how do we set our face toward these? That would be a date where we actually sit and we eat and we look at each other and we talk to each other. We want to make sure there's something, where, that there's a, some kind of uh, communion that's taking place between the two of us. And what Daniel says is when I found out about this, we're right there at the very end. This is good news. And by the way, if he's thinking good news, it's unlikely he's thinking, well, this is probably going to be some kind of awful uh, event that's going to be taking place. No, this is the end. We're about to experience the good parts here. So what should we do? He goes to God. He sets his face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So what we're addressing this evening, and it'll be a fairly short message after a 15-minute introduction here, is that... Um, that he prayed. And one thing I know is this year we started, we started with prayer and we spent months on prayer. And I'm going to take a quick drink here. But we started in prayer because we knew that would be important. And I was burdened about that. And lo and behold, right there at the end of the prayer season that we had, which we emphasized, uh, and I don't know if you remember or if you were in here, but we had three months where every single service was, was or every Sunday service was, was geared towards prayer, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And we we're keeping up our prayer journals and looking forward. To, and that was going on. And then suddenly this pandemic hits and it's shattering the world. But we prayed. We were ready for it. And now it may have took a toll on you. You know, perhaps uh, I, don't, I don't know if you watch like sci-fi movies and stuff like that, where they have their their uh, energy force fields around them that that can only take a certain number. And it always got me like the amount of energy, like we're going to lose our force field in just a moment. And. We can't only take so many other laser blasts against us or whatever. Uh, well, anyways, prayer is kind of that way in which we build up and we're, we're, we're fortifying. But it's not enough that we used to pray or that we did pray. In other words, we didn't set out on this adventure with prayer and now we're good forever. We have to continue in that, don't we? 
Daniel is older. Now, I'm going to be careful. I'm not saying he's old. He's just in his 80s. Okay, so he's older. And in his 80s, we understand that he's prayerful, even though he can say, well, wait a second. I've run my course. I'm in retirement season. I've already, I've already written down a whole bunch of stuff for people to read. I've already been teaching people. I've had this influence. I've prophesied. I've interpreted dreams. I've already done this. Why can't I just retire? Because what he understood was a necessity for God himself. And so in this passage of scripture, here's a couple things we're going to find here in regards to it. First off, we notice his preparation as far as how does he pray. His preparation. One of the big things that takes place here is this external process um, that he gets started with. He, he set my, I set my face unto the Lord. Here's how I approached God is what he's saying. My direction was to God. Now, the, the first thing that he does is start saying words directly to God. No. In fact, what he's going to do is he's going to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. He gets himself ready. There's this mourning about him. He gets himself emotionally and even physically ready to talk to God directly. Now, by the way, he's already established. We've, we've already seen it uh, in previous chapters that he had a pattern of prayer, didn't he? In fact, perhaps it was through his time of study that when he got to studying and he's reading this and it's coming up on prayer time or whatever the sundial, how that would work. I don't, I'm sure they didn't have watches, but it's time. All right, sun's right above us. It's time to go ahead and, and talk to God. And, and as he's getting ready for this time in which he's going to talk to God, he's preparing himself. One of the things that's important when we pray is we have to remember that it's not a casual conversation. Now, we can have those, by the way. There are times, I've had a lot of times, honestly, I had probably half of my times of, 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 of being alone tend to be in my vehicle, or I drive a lot. And as I drive a lot, the, the, the uh, temptation is to press a button and something will play on the radio or the, you know, I can pair it with my phone or whatever and I play something. And, and that's the temptation to have noise. But we're not very good at being quiet. We're, we, we just can't take it. We have to have something. I've been to people's houses. I've gone visiting them before. And generally, by the way, I've not had this in the, in the church here. But when I go to visit people that visit the church, I'll, I'll go to their house and it'd be randomly in the afternoon and they're doing stuff and the TV's just blaring, absolutely blaring. You seen that? God, they're not even watching it. They don't even know what's going on. But it's noise. And they just, they have to have that noise. And we feel like we're alone and we're so lonely if we don't have it. We are so social. If we don't have something going on that will fabricate something just so it sounds good. And not knowing that the sweet, still, small voice of the Lord is sufficient when those times we're alone with him. And so when he's talking in this passage of scripture, he's talking about getting ready to spend time with God. He's preparing. He, he, um, he talked about with fasting. What does, this, what does this mean? If he fasted, that means he wasn't from one moment to the next. I read this two minutes later after I finished fasting. I went and prayed. Right? That, that's kind of a cheat, isn't it, when, you're, when it comes to fasting? Uh, fasting would mean that he is, based on other scriptures, he was giving up food on this passage. So maybe at least a meal, maybe more, several days a meal. He's preparing to talk to God about a subject matter. Have you ever talked to somebody? I remember um, I, I didn't ask my 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 uh, wife's father for permission. I asked. She grew up with her mom, so I, I I asked her mom for permission, and I was just asked about this recently. So, anyways, I, I did. I, I asked, and I was kind of like, okay, I've got to I've got to talk to her about marrying her daughter. And so as I, I was I was preparing, and we're gonna have this conversation. And uh, she was in Tennessee, and I'm in Florida, and I didn't have a vehicle to drive up there, so we're gonna make a phone call, and I've got to ask her. And uh, like, I'm going to prepare. And so, and I can't just be like, hey, can I marry your daughter? We've got to build up to it, right? We've got to prepare, we've got to be nice, figure out something nice to say, you know. And I, I made up some good stuff. And, and we had a conversation and, and all real things, all real things. And, and then I talked to her. Why? Because this is a very big deal. And here's what God is pointing out here. Daniel is demonstrating when he wants to talk to God about this very big deal, he prepared himself with externals. He got those things right. He made it quiet. He separated himself even physically for the purpose of prayer. In other words, he fasted. In other words, more important than food was God. More important than, than eating something was what God wanted to say to him. And so he got, got himself ready. Sackcloth and ashes, the idea of mourning that's going to be prepared there. Um, verse number four goes on a little bit more in regards to this. There's this contrition and brokenness that's about him. In verse number four, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. Made my confession. And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keep the covenant, keeping the covenant and mercy. There's a word covenant again. And mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. 
Now, what he's referencing there is something you find in multiple passages of Scripture. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, at verse 36, the Bible says, The Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou set, shall set over unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. Thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. What he's addressing is that when you go, you're going to do these really bad things. And what he's pointing out is that, God, you just did exactly what you said you would do. You provided for even the negative parts on this. And he's broken about how he does this. He makes this confession in which he addresses the person of God. He talks about the embarrassment. Even in this, there's a confession of sin and of shame. In verse 5, he says, We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgment. In fact, go down to verse number 16. It says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for our iniquities of our and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that be about us. What he's addressing here is just how bad they were. Now, you might think, well, wait a second, Daniel, you're a good guy. In fact, you're one of the elites in Jerusalem. You were brought there all the way to Babylon. You're a great guy. You're a teacher. You're a prophet. In fact, when there's some terrible party going on with people that you should have been involved with as far as politically or socially, you weren't even there back in chapter number uh, six when, when that was all taking place. Now, what, what he's pointing out, they had to bring him to this party to decipher what the writing on the wall was, right? He's a good guy, and yet he points this out as this confession and shame. You ever been ashamed of something that you try to address the fact that that you don't want to be around it? You ever been confronted about something that you were doing wrong and you don't like it? My 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 kids are great examples for this because adults we feel comfortable telling them about our stories. So our kids will do that where we'll catch them doing something and suddenly they don't want to say anything. They can be talking all they want and then you catch them with something and they don't want to say anything. The blood rushes to the face, slight redness that goes on there, mumbling of the words. We're not really sure. And Daniel's saying, "That's me. I'm in shame." I'm at a point where I don't know what to do. God, so I'm going to go to you. And so he's ashamed. There's guilt in this. By the way, sometimes we're very good about hiding how this works. What he's addressing is that we are guilty. It has been diagnosed. It has been determined by God's judgment that this is bad what we've done. And so he, he uh, makes sure that he addresses this. He confesses it. He agrees with God. He describes uh, the word confusion and um, all those things that are there that this is not proper. This shouldn't be there. And this is an astonishment to the rest of the world. You claim to be God's people, but it's not going the way it's supposed to go for you guys, is it? Why? Well, we did this. We're the one that created this way. So there's this feeling of shame that takes place, this um, marred testimony in verse number 16. And so anyways, um, a couple of things. I want you to see this pattern so we understand the way we approach God. Look at the pattern as well. Uh, and beyond the preparation we find in verse number three, the pattern here uh, in verse number four is that he is first off lying in line with God's word. He addresses Jeremiah, the prophet, when he addresses Jeremiah, specifically the books. And back in verse number one, he talks about, I'm sorry, verse number two, he understood by books. In other words, by reading books. Now we assume, now it doesn't say specifically that it's just reading scriptures, but Regardless, he's reading books. Now, a couple possibilities here. One is that there's a lot of people that write about a lot of things. For instance, I've read many books about the Bible, but the referencing the truth part, right? Regardless, what he's pointing out is that your word says this, and I've been reading books. We assume by this he's referring to things that have been written before. Jeremiah would have been one of the prophets that wrote a book, right? That would have been one of them. And as he reads them, he's pointing to what God said is going to take place. Back in chapter uh, Jeremiah, chapter number um, 30. 29, as we mentioned earlier. So anyways, the point, though, is that he's lined up specifically, this is what you say, God. And he's lining up with God's word. In other words, when he went to pray to God, it's because God himself had stirred his heart. Now, you'll notice while he has had times in which he heard from God, he had visions, he saw dreams, he interpreted dreams. This isn't one of them. What took place here was he read God's word. And then God stirred him by the reading of that word to do something. Now, one of the big things, if you want to delve deeper into your spiritual life, specifically your prayer life, it has to be guided in line with God's word. Oftentimes we go to, to God in prayer and we want to spend a lot of time with God in prayer, but we don't make the investment of knowing what God is saying to us. When the word of God leads you to pray, God himself has stirred you to do so. 
Has your spouse, your loved one, your children, your parents, or good friend ever motivated you to do something that because they said something that you want to do? For instance, we're coming up on uh, on Christmas. Did you know that? Uh, the kids, the kids know that. Uh, it, it's funny because um, you know, I try to keep explaining. Santa's not real, and my kids are like, "Yes, yes, he is." And so we'll have a disagreement in our household, right? And so, uh, so anyways, one of the things that happens though is uh, we'll go to the store, and they they always want to look at the toy section. So I allow that torture for them for a little while, and we'll go to the toy section, and they give us some clues of like, "Boy, ah, this would be really great," and it, it would be nice if I had this for Christmas. Maybe Santa. Wink, wink, wink. Will will uh, will give me this for for Christmas. And uh, anyways, they're they're showing me their and now. Well, here's what's gonna happen. By what they're saying, by what they're showing me, that stirs me to do something. Okay. Well, we need to consider this. Maybe, maybe we'll think about. And I don't know if investment is the right term on a depreciating item, but regardless, maybe we'll we'll consider something like this. And it's stirring us now to think about certain things, and we make decisions based on. Interactions. Now, here's what God is doing. God has given us his word, and when we are in his word, he's going to stir us to action. This is what's going to happen. Now, the problem is that if we look at the scriptures the way it's oftentimes prescribed to do it, where we take a, our daily dose of scripture, like, okay, well, I've got to read that one verse or that one chapter or those three chapters or whatever, and we just do it, okay, it's done, put it away, and think nothing of it, we're hoping that it'll just internalize in such a way that apart from us wanting it, it'll just take place. But God is relational, and that he wants you, right? Now, if this is the case, then we need to be able to take scriptures as, what is God giving me? What is he telling me? It's not just for you to know more. It's not for you to learn something new. We, are, we ought to learn. But the point is to learn more of God. God is all throughout scriptures. It doesn't matter if it's in a verse of scripture that doesn't say his name or doesn't mention a promise. It is God. And God wants you to know, does that motivate you then to seek him? For instance, there may be times where you're reading specific commands, even something like the book of Proverbs, which is convicting by means of its application, but usually it's not addressing things like our spiritual uh, prayer life. And, and while, yes, it does address it, but it talks about debt and friendships and, and all sorts of stuff. Are we taking that? And that's motivating us to, to seek God about how we're getting along with our neighbor and how we're addressing our, our own honesty in the way in which we conduct business. All those things are vital that we're looking at the way God has for us. It's stirred by his scriptures. George Mueller uh, writes in regards to his testimony that, that for 40 years he tried to pray without the Bible. In other words, he would pray and he sought God because this was burdened. But later, for the next 40 years, says that he opened the Bible. He went to the Bible to pray and it changed everything. In other words, he would seek scriptures and that's what would guide him to, to uh, do what he needed to. There's a whole theological basis behind it, but we're going to move on. Verse number four. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and my, made my confession. Next part is this confessional. This is a bold an undeniable confession about who he is. Daniel is pointing out something that we're, we're bad. He's, he's pointing this out. In fact, I'll read some of it and I think, wait a second, you're kind of, you're kind of just lumping in everybody. You're thinking, oh, them and how bad they are because that's really easy to do. I was telling my wife earlier today that, boy, it is so easy to tell how judgmental other people are. I mean, you can just see it, can't you? Now, the, the point in that, obviously, is that we're judgmental. We're like, everybody's judgmental. You know, I can't stand them. Well, yeah, yes, we are. But Daniel says, yeah, they're bad. But he says, I'm bad. He says, I have messed up. We have done this error. Even though he was a teenager, when he left Jerusalem, he's going to take this time to address how they are. Now, notice he said he names a sin. Let that be an example for you. Whenever you're confessing to God, you, can, you name your sin. Sometimes we say things like, well, God, just forgive us for everything bad we've done. There's aspects where that could be okay in the sense of God. I don't know what it is. Um, if I, I have erred some way, please reveal that so we may confess it. But you'll notice that he doesn't gloss over anything. He addresses these things in verse number five. Sin, committed iniquity, done wickedly, rebelled, departing from thy precepts. In verse number seven, um, towards the end there. Uh, because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. Verse 8 at the end there. Because we have sinned against thee. Verse number 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against thee. The point is over and over again he names the sin for what it is. We need to name those sins. Whatever it is. Sometimes we want to give little pet names. Like oh you know I, just, I wasn't careful with my eyes and what I was looking at. Or you know I should have been nicer God. Just put it out there. God it was wicked what I said to that individual. Now, I was, I was evil in the way I responded. All those things that I would have done, the damage to your testimony. We need to be honest about what we're doing. And stop glossing over it like it's not a big deal. If we're going to have this deeper prayer with God and we're going to seek God for what he has for us, we have to be honest in our confession before him. To confess, by the way, has the concept of uh, agreeing with. 
Do you see your sin with the way God sees it? Is that present there? If not, then we're missing our opportunity in the time of prayer. Daniel, by the way, is confessing nationally. Now, by the way, the book of Jeremiah describes the fact that this will all be taken care of this time, the 70-year time period, when the nation calls on God, right? They're going to get right. They're going to seek God, and God will be found. Now, here's the thing. You might think, well, wait a second. Daniel's a godly guy. Why didn't he do this early on? Great question. Daniel's been godly this whole time, hasn't he? In fact, even early on, he wouldn't defile himself with the king's meat. But it's not until the 70th year, or maybe 69th year based on this, this passage, that he finally goes to God and says, all right, we confess as a nation. Daniel chapter 9 is giving us the confession of the nation. Now, what we're saying here is the leadership is confessing and other, people's will do, well, other people will do so also. And so nationally, they're actually confessing. This is that national confession in which they're calling out God, unto God. They are taking that prerogative as we. Now, I would say this to fathers and to husbands, to teachers. We need to make sure that we have the same mentality that the people that we're leading, the people that we're instructing, we discuss that. So many times it's very easy to blame our wife or blame somebody else for the things that we're not, we're not doing properly, where there should be heartbreak to the leaders when things go wrong. As a pastor, it concerns me when there's sin here. Not because I'm the one that committed the sin, but this is the way we're going. And we as a people have sinned before God. I'm not suggesting that Charity Baptist Church will stand before God in judgment one day as a unit. And he will not judge Charity Baptist Church as an organization. He'll judge us individually. But there's no question there's consequences for the collective whole like there is for your family and those people in which you lead. And Daniel's taking a collective whole as far as the responsibility for what's taking place there. We need to be able to teach people properly. Um, for the sake of time, we're just going to keep going here. Um, he's confident of the person of God. Notice again, in verse 4, And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God. The idea of dreadful doesn't mean that he's just like the scary God. That's a part of it. There is that dread. But the fact that in his mighty power that he would cause dread. In other words, it's a fearful thing to stand before him. The consequences in which he brings up because of sin against them are such that should be taken uh, seriously. But what he's pointing out is the, the testimony of God. Psalm 106, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remember not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. In other words, back then, our forefathers were bad when they were getting ready to cross the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. Proverbs 28, 13, similar idea. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso for, confesseth and forsaketh them, shall have mercy. What God is providing is an opportunity for mercy. What Daniel is saying is we want mercy. How are we going to do it? We have to confess. We have to go back to the person and character of God himself. Now here's the wonderful truth. We get to do certain things like addressing the, addressing the fact that the God that we're talking to when we pray, regardless of what sins we've brought here, we're addressing a merciful God. Under the under, given the understanding that we see things the way God sees them, that we confess and we forsake, God says, I have cre- tremendous mercy. He's not going to hold it over you. Those times where you would apologize to an individual and say, oh, yeah, well, what about that one time? That's done. God is never going to bring it up and say, oh, well, you, you, I would trust you. But, you know, three years ago, there's that one time you said you would do that for me. And I'm just not going to trust you again. No, he's abundant in his mercy. Back in the book of 1 Samuel, when they wanted the king, they shouldn't have. They were being rebellious to do so. God addresses them through the prophet Samuel. And when they do so, that they go back to their tents and they get right with God right then and there. It doesn't say over the course of the next three years they have to prove themselves. Right then and, right then and there. God knew their heart and they knew that moment that as they were committing those things to God, God addressed it. Do you realize that when you confess and forsake, here's what God is saying. is that I accept you and he applies that abundant mercy where yes, he should take you down. Yes, he should destroy your lives. But he does it because of his abundant mercy in which he has loved you. And then we go to not just the person of God, then we go to the, to the, to the aspect of God's glory. In this, he's going to address, now we've, we've go through a lot of verses with, we've really skipped through, and I encourage you to read them on your own. But in verse number 17, it says, Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplication, and cause thy face to shine upon Thy sanctuary that is desolate. In other words, Jerusalem's temple is not what it used to be. 
The glory of God is not seen. In fact, Jerusalem's temple, the temple there in Jerusalem, the temple to God would have been that bright spot, shi literally shiny. And on a hill, people would have seen it everywhere. They were coming up towards it. That's the most, the most prominent thing. And he's saying that there, there's nothing there. That, that there was shown to people and demonstrated this nation really loves God. And it's all about him. And the things that would come from there would demonstrate that the God of these people, obviously is a great God, is saying, that testimony is not known about. God hasn't changed, but the world doesn't know it right now. Your glory is not seen uh, there in Jerusalem. Verse 18, oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. This is powerful. This is pointing to the same thing we've seen, same theme we've seen throughout Scripture. It's not my righteousness. God, I'm not calling on you because I've been faithful to going to church every Sunday, or because I started coming on Wednesday nights, or because I'm praying ten times a day, or because I give money to the poor, or because I fast. I'm not doing those things. I'm not asking you because of this. I'm asking you, God, because you're merciful. This is your character. This is your person. And he implores. He he beseeches. Uh, he be Beseech, I, I went lost. Him. He's going to seek out the, the mercy of God himself. And as he seeks out this mercy, he's pointing out, look, we're your children. Would you please be merciful to us? Because you are a merciful God. In fact, the Psalms are going to address a lot of other issues that are going on. You'll notice the pattern is always that David or whoever the psalmist is in, in, psalmist is in those Psalms is always addressing the person of God for why they're calling on for that. In other words, because you are strong, would you give me that safety? In other words, he doesn't have to become strong. He is strong. Because he is our salvation, would you save us from this thing? In other words, he is this, so we're going to call on him for that. So he's saying, I need your mercy. We'll call on you specifically because you're a merciful God. And so for a Christian today in 2020, you say, say, God, I'm your child. Not because of what I'm providing for you, Lord, but because of your own glory. I'm secure in the payment that was made for me by Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. We can say things to God like you saved me. You are my redeemer, demonstrating his might and power to be able to do so. You are my deliverer. Your glory will demonstrate, be demonstrated when you deliver me from this thing which I'm going through. And so the point is we're going back to the person of God. Now, by the way, it's really hard to know more about his person if you don't know this Bible, right? Because God reveals himself through the Bible. You've got to know the Bible, which goes back to our first point, be in line with scriptures. Pray the scriptures. If we don't, boy, we're going to be weak in our Christianity. You will never advance further in your prayer life without the Bible. And so tonight's admonition specifically has to do with prayer. Would you be praying? Uh, I'm, I'm concerned that with things that are going on in this world right now, the divide is so sharply seen amongst Christians and non-Christians. And it's cre it's that, that, that chasm continues to grow, doesn't it? The one of the things that we do is it's very easy to identify things that are right, so we just do them. And, uh, and we forget something. We forget all about God. You know. Let it be that the people of God do not get into a point where like, we're, we're better now than them. Because of our righteousness, says, we're, we're away from that. No, we're people of God that seek God more. And by the way, he's going to want to understand some more things about what's going to go on in prophecy. Is it guided by prayer? In other words, when you go to prophecy, are you praying even about what God would have for you? Or is it just to know more? I'll be honest. Sometimes in my study, I just want to know what this means. And we're not seeing God in it. And we need to make sure that when we look at prophecy even, that should draw us to God, not to something. And we miss the person of God in all of that. God is demonstrating his great might and his great power. And he's going to be very gracious when he's going to respond to uh, Jeremiah, starting in verse number 20. And so anyways, we'll, we'll go to these things. Um, powerful passage of scripture. I encourage you to read it. Um, We'll be in the rest of the chapter next week, and hopefully we'll, uh, I'll give you all the answers you could possibly ever know in about the 70 weeks at the end of Daniel. You're going to miss it, brother. I'm gonna, all, all of them. Every answer is going to be there. All right, so you got you got a copy, though. I think you'll be able to read it. All right, so anyways, let's go ahead and... Um